Certainly people recognize your great work on Heart of Louisiana. Uh, in video, a surprise to some that you do this phenomenal still photography. When did that transition happen? When did that come into you? When I do a Heart of Louisiana story, I'm what they call a one-man band. So there's, there's no cameraman, there's no producer, it's just Dave. By doing that, you learn a little bit about photography, you learn about exposures. You learn what makes a pretty good shot and what makes a pretty lousy shot because I'll go back and look at the video, especially early on, and go, oh man, why did I shoot that? I should have done this. And so you're kind of self-critiquing. A couple of years ago, my COVID project was to start a website. So when I do a story on TV, I, I do a version online. And for that, you want some eye candy. You want some nice pictures to go along with it. So that is also focused me more on taking still photographs as well. Whether you're taking video or a still, you're telling a story. It would seem it would be a little more difficult to tell that story in a still. You know from being in television, when you're writing a TV story, it helps if you look at the video. And that video will guide you in what you can and what you cannot write about, because if you say it, you gotta have some video that goes along with that in the story. And so when you look at it from that standpoint, yeah, the pictures do tell the story. They're part of the story. But I've really enjoyed photographing the night sky. And the Milky Way in the camera's eye looks spectacular. But the Milky Way always looks like the Milky Way. And where the story comes in is what else is in the frame. Yes. You give it a sense of place when you start to include other things in the picture, things that we can connect to. You know what a shrimp boat looks like. You know what an old barn looks like, you know. And so when you start to put those two things together, then the mind starts to, to create these, these stories. But you do incredible sky shots and that has drama to it it has emotion to it it does and i think part of what the the drama of it is is that it's something that we don't normally look at if you live in a city if you live in the suburbs if you live next to a shopping center if there are street lights up and down the street if you uh, live next to an industrial plant that night sky that darkness is not there all of this light, this light pollution, it fills the sky. And especially in an area like South Louisiana where it's so humid, that humidity is droplets of water in the air. And guess what? Those droplets of water reflect light. That's one reason why I've taken so many pictures out west as I've kind of developed this passion and this love of night sky photography. The skies are darker out there. Let's take that first moment when you said, I see the darkness, I see the beauty. The first time you see a dark sky without the moon and you see those brilliant stars, it's one of those moments that just kind of, it imprints on you, I think. And you'll always say, oh yeah, I remember when we went to such and such a place, oh, the, the, the stars were just magnificent. And it was at one place that you opened your eyes and looked up and said, I see the art of it. I see the whole thing of it. I had hiked to the bottom of the Grand Canyon in 2010 and spent a couple of nights on the bottom. I made the mistake of doing it in late June. The bottom of the Grand Canyon is a desert and it's hot. We decided to leave before dawn so we could get halfway up the trail before it got too hot. And as we're walking a footbridge over the Colorado River at the bottom of the canyon, there was no moon this night. I looked up and I just stopped dead in my tracks on this bridge. The stars were so bright. They were so bright that they, without flashlights, they lit up our trail. 
You could see the walls of the canyon. You could see the reflection in the Colorado River, and it was just starlight. It was some years later, the first time I ever took a picture of the night sky. It was uh, 2017. I was shooting a Heart of Louisiana story in Rain, Louisiana, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's the frog capital of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so I went out at night with this cute, engaged couple. It was their date night. They went frogging. That's a big one. Look how fat. And we're in a crawfish pond. I was in this vast, open crawfish pond prairie area, and it was just horizon to horizon. It was stars. And so I said, eh, let me try this. I've never done this before. Wide angle lens and put it on a tripod and aimed it toward the sky and tried five seconds. Nah, that's not long enough. 10 seconds, you know, a little bit more. And, but finally came home with pictures in a crawfish pond with some, some stars overhead. And that was my first uh, nighttime star shot. And, that, and I was hooked at that point. And it's, it's almost a religious feeling of we are specks here. We are a moment here. This thing is just grand. And I wonder if you've ever had those kinds of emotions looking at it. I do, and that's one of the reasons that I really love to do it because there's a work aspect to it. You're focused on trying to take some pictures, and I may spend 45 minutes to maybe an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, trying different angles, different compositions, taking pictures, trying to get everything I can get. I always, before I pick up, I turn everything off and I will sit there and stargaze. The longer you look at it, you'll see the occasional shooting star. It will happen. And then you'll see uh, a jetliner flying at 40,000 feet above the earth, that little tiny blinking light, you'll see that moving. And then you'll see satellites, like little tiny pinpoint stars that but they're moving and you'll see satellites circling overhead. And then you realize, okay, we have billions and billions of stars. And you think you're taking it all in. And then after 15 minutes or so you go, oh my goodness, there is another billion stars behind those that I didn't even notice before. It, it, it almost gets, I think, beyond the point of my brain being able to comprehend what infinity is yes. and the vastness of this. It's something that I, I, I wish more people would find that moment, that place to, to go absorb what's up over us every night. You have a wonderful photograph of yourself under the Milky Way pointing. And I just want to know the thought process. Was it, I'm reaching for the stars, I'm a human in this grand universe. And when I took that picture, I'm standing at the bottom of Death Valley. It's the lowest point in North America. It's 280 something feet below sea level. It was around the 1st of October and at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's still 105 degrees out there. Put the camera on a 10 second timer. So hit the timer, you run out there and you, you, know, you hold a flashlight. The challenge is that camera shutter is gonna be open for like 25 seconds. If I move, it, it gets blurry. That's me reaching for the stars. I mean, I certainly felt this connection as I was taking the pictures and then to have this selfie, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you can go back and look at is, is kind of neat. Well, it's the beauty of our earth, of the skies, but to remind everyone, we are here. Humans are here. One of the Milky Way pictures I've taken in Louisiana was up at Poverty Point. Now, Poverty Point has become a World Heritage Site just in the last five to 10 years. These are mounds that were built by the ancient inhabitants of Northeast Louisiana, and they built a city, which is what makes it so remarkable. And the tallest mound, I think, is around maybe 70 feet high. And I, I watched the Milky Way just rise above this mound. And then what was really cool, after the Milky Way got up, this bright star, right over the center of the mound pops up, and that's the planet Jupiter. I was imagining these, these ancient people who were here 3,500 years ago and them seeing this every, every night. The, the mind starts to connect the sky with people and what they did and what they might have been thinking. But that's also the thread through time. 
that 3,500 years ago, on that mound, people were looking up, seeing what you were looking at recently. It is that connection. Those stars have been there for millennia. You have a fascinating shot of the Milky Way, and the only sort of life form is a portalette. I don't think it was too alive that night, but you know, it was one of those things that was the first place that I went in Louisiana to try to take a Milky Way picture. That was down on the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge down in southwest Louisiana, very close to the coast. I decided to take a panorama to, you know, take a shot here, move the camera, take another shot, and it's probably 10 or 12 shots that are then stitched together in post-production to get the entire Milky Way that literally stretches from the southern horizon to the northern horizon. Pretty dark what I'm looking at, and then when I'm looking at the pictures, I'm like, oh my goodness, there was a portal that, <laughs> that was in the distance that the Milky Way does this amazing arc over. And I think that's an example of one of those pictures that might well tell a story. It's such a dramatic picture of the dead tree reaching up to the Milky Way. That is one of those pictures that I think tells a story. That's down in Plaquemines Parish along the Mississippi River. And what you have are what used to be groves of oak trees that because of sinking land, because of saltwater intrusion and hurricanes, that salt water has killed these groves of oak trees. And so when I look at that, I see what almost looks like a, a graveyard of trees under this star-filled sky with the Milky Way overhead. And uh, there's another place where I got a very similar image down in, in Eastern St. Bernard Parish, down around Wyklosky and Hopedale Highway, where you have, again, these oak trees that have died because of our, our sinking marsh. Uh, they're not going to survive, but you know, stars are still there. One of the most dramatic pictures is this twisted tree, and you do think of Harry Potter reaching for the Milky Way. That is in the Inyo National Forest. It's in the Eastern Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. That tree is called a bristlecone pine. There's a group of trees in that area that are the oldest living trees on Earth. And somehow they have survived in this barren, almost tundra-like environment in this rocky mountaintops out in California. This tree has been there forever, longer than any other tree on Earth. 4,500 years, you know, and it's still there reaching for the stars. You also have a great picture where it looks like there's a rainbow coming out of the ground. That is from Yosemite in California, a national park, one of my favorite national parks in America. And that is actually what's called a moonbow. And that is uh, Yosemite Falls. And you can only experience this in the spring with all the snow melt, the waterfalls are roaring. There's so much water coming down from the hilltops. And it happens when there's a full moon and you have all of this mist from the waterfall. And when the moon is at the exact right angle, it's just like the sun hitting a rainbow. And it creates this moonbow over the waterfall under this moonlit star-filled sky. Just a magnificent picture, sky, ocean, and one bird. That's in Gulf Shores, on the beach in Gulf Shores. And I was actually out on the beach waiting for the Milky Way to rise. And while I was waiting, I kind of got this feeling like there were, I wasn't alone. Because <laughs> I sensed some movement. There was this great blue heron that was right at the edge of the water. And so I swung the camera around and I start taking pictures of it. The challenge is that the bird is slowly kind of walking along the edge of the water, I guess looking for a meal. Well, when I click the shutter, because I'm trying to shoot the stars, that shutter is open for 20, 25 seconds. And most of the shots, the bird starts to move and so it blurs out. But there was one frame where the bird with one leg raised stood perfectly still for like 25 seconds. And it was just, okay, that's all I need. Thank you, go catch fish. I'm done. Give me a, a typical experience of you setting up 
for a night sky? There, there are certain things you have to have. One is you have to not have light pollution. Number two is you have to not have the moon up. I'll look at this, this light pollution map and say, okay, I'm gonna be in this town. How dark is the sky there? And if it's dark, I'll go, okay, so where can I go to where I can maybe get a picture? It needs to be a place that the public can access. And often I'll look for a lake or a pond. And then I always, I always go there during the day because I want to see what I'm getting into when it's dark. How did you learn this? Actually, I went to a, a photography workshop and it was in Zion National Park and it was geared toward Milky Way photography. And basically, I mean, there are about only a half dozen things that in turn, you shoot manually. You have to know how to focus at night. You, how long the exposure is gonna be. A lot of cameras can do it. You just have to learn the, 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 the few settings on your camera. And then these folks took us to places where it would be a cool picture. One of them was uh, looking down the valley there in Zion National Park with the Virgin River down below us. And another one was this old bent pine tree that was hanging off the edge of a rock. And the Milky Way just goes right up from that. And it, but they had already scouted it and they put us right where we needed to be. Before we end talking about the Milky Way, would you define the Milky Way? So what I learned in, in science class in elementary school is it, it's our galaxy. That is the galaxy that our solar system is a speck in. And a lot of people ask me this, but can I see that with the naked eye? And the answer is yes, it's there, but you need those, those factors we talked about, the lack of a moon, a darker sky and knowing where to look and when to look, but it's there. And, and usually to the naked eye, it, it looks as this kind of thin band of almost of clouds. And the camera can do a better job than my eye can because that camera can keep that lens open for 20, 25, 30 seconds. And it's just pulling in the starlight. I was actually uh, out near Mobile Bay a few weeks ago and I'm watching the sunset, the sun goes down, the sky is still, we're in the blue hour, the sky is still a little blue, and I look up and I'm going, wait a minute, I think I'm seeing the Milky Way, and it's not even dark yet. I know where it's supposed to be, and there it was, even before it was totally dark. You also do sunsets. That's when the light is at its best, is morning, late evening. I will tell you this, and, and you have a place in Maine, and, and, and I sent you a picture of a, a lighthouse there. Watch this next time you're in a place with a pretty sunset. After the sun goes down, you start to see this color, mm -hmm. this gold, this orange, this deep red, these, these violets, these, all of these colors, and they'll, they'll reflect off the clouds that may be in the sky. There will be a glow on the horizon. So often the best color may be a half hour after sunset. And that, that's what happened for one of my favorite moments. It was, uh, the sun had already, it was about to set, but it had been nothing spectacular. I was tired, I'd been shooting a story in a kayak on Lake Martin. And I'm packing up my camera gear and I look through the trees and I just see orange. It's like, oh man, it's going on right now. Grab the camera, get the tripod, set up and start snapping pictures of this amazing sunset and it's it's truly one of my favorite images of Lake Martin there's a there's a kayaker who just happened to paddle right in the reflection of the sun as it was going down and I mean I almost missed it so you have traveled the state you've traveled the United States but this state what's the most special place I think I would say Lake Martin Lake Martin is a, it's a man-made lake that's full of cypress trees that's a, a few miles south of Bro Bridge one of the very first stories I did, it may have been story number two or three for the heart of Louisiana like 13 years ago, was on Lake Martin. And it was an example of you never know what you're going to see. I was out there right around daybreak and it was one of those mornings where you look out across this, this lake and there was this kind of low mist, this kind of light layer of fog just above the water with the trees. And I remember seeing a, a, a egret flying through this scene and somehow I was able to, to get this shot and it, it just, 
It, it was just one of those just beautiful moments that I just happened to have the camera rolling when, when it happened. What you're doing is you're drawing a beautiful picture of nature. And I just wonder how you feel that some people um, really have no interest or they're uh, interested in other things, but the element of appreciating nature in your life is so important. Here's a perfect example. I was in uh, Yellowstone a few years ago and it was in June, and so Yellowstone National Park is packed with cars and people during the day. And there would be lines of cars, maybe a half mile or longer of cars stopped waiting to get into a parking lot to go see this geyser, that waterfall, all these sorts of things that we want to see there. It, it's an amazing place. I was going around trying to find a place I could come back after dark because I wanted to get kind of a mountain vista look where I'm out of the trees and I can get the Milky Way. It's probably 11 o'clock at night. I drive for an hour. I do not pass another car the entire time mm. because everybody's exhausted. They bring the kids back to the hotels. They get pizza. Kids are playing video games. Mom and dad are going, oh, we got to go do this again tomorrow. It's fun, but you know, we're worn out. <laughs> And then when they leave after a week, they go back to a suburban home, a city, some place where you can't see what I just saw, that dark, amazingly clear, star-filled sky. And I, I guess by taking pictures of it and showing people these pictures, you know, people go, oh, wow, I'd like to see that. You can. But it, it's not in our lifestyle to, to wander outside at night and look up at the sky. You know, we but don't do that. It's a beautiful balance to be able to live your life and all of the complexities of that, but to also see that this is before we were here and after we're gone is here. The beautiful sky, the beautiful stars, the sunrise, the sunset. And it's, it's pretty much free. It's there every day. One of the things that kind of sparked my interest in this is that both of my parents were school teachers. And so during the summer months, uh, they had, you know, two and a half, three months off. And we bought a little used camper and crammed five of us into a little 17 foot mm. camper trailer. And back then you could stay in a national park campground for a dollar a night. Wow. And so that kind of fit the school teacher's budget. And we take these road trips. And so I was exposed to it and I enjoyed it. And I, I believe that if families will find a way to take the kids out and take them for a hike, go walk a nature trail. A lot of folks did it for the first time during COVID. Uh, in fact, my, my wife told me after a few months of lockdown, she goes, look, okay, I, I know you go to nature trail. I gotta get outside, where can we go? And so we started doing Saturday hikes. With all of the magnificent places you've been, which one just stands out as your greatest memory? It's actually a very recent memory. <laughs> I did a bucket list thing this year. Back in the late spring, I went on a, uh, a week-long rafting trip through the Grand Canyon down the Colorado River. And every night I would, I would lay in the cot and just stare up and you see the rotation of the stars. I can find the North Star. That's the one thing I know where it is. And it's rock steady all night, but then you see, you know, everything slowly just rotates around. And I would lay there in, in bed, kind of exhausted from the, the long day we had just had. And I was like, I don't want to go to sleep. It was spiritual. It, it really, it, it really, I think, touches your soul to, to be laying there and just totally immersed in this, this incredible, uh, universe that's that that we are this tiny part of you know but as we mature and both of us have had health issues and I just wonder if that's not also impacted a little bit um, how you're looking at things it does and look I think with aging you you start to go okay so wait in, in 10 years I'll be that old and then in 15 I'm gonna be that old I mean the runway starts to look a little shorter and we always talk about, yeah, one of these days I want to go do that. Oh. And, and I think that, that certainly uh, if you're in a situation where you have to deal with some health issues, that uh, I was fortunate that uh, things worked out well for me. 
And my wife, though, was, was very encouraging for, you know, why don't you uh, go do this workshop? Why don't, why don't, I, I know you like to do that. Go take pictures. And so um, I, I, I think that's part of it. Sure. But it, it, there's also a heightened appreciation for the world, <laughs> for nature, yeah, for yeah. beauty, natural beauty. Uh, when you think, I'm not going to be here forever. I, will, I really want to see these things. Someone asked me, well, well why do you do this? Well, why do you take these pictures? And, and I probably haven't done a good enough job of, of sharing some of them. I really hope that when someone looks at a picture of this Milky Way over the old barn, they go, where is that? Yeah. I'd like to see that. Yeah. You know, where is that? That they find a way to, to go do it. It's, it's, I guess it's just maybe just a little, trying to light a spark a little bit with, with people. It's meant a lot to me. It continues to mean a lot to me. And I just kind of sharing the idea of that, you know, there's some, some other things out there that are pretty cool and fulfilling to do. How has all of this really impacted your daily life? Um, it's made more work. I've learned that when I'm traveling with other people, uh, the pictures that I take are going to be with my, my phone. I'm not setting up tripods. Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that it, getting that one shot may take 10 minutes, it may take an hour. Uh, and you may not get it. But I think it's given me a, an appreciation. It's put me more in tune with, with what's going on. I know there was a full moon a few nights ago. I know in a week and a half when I'm traveling, there will be no moon. And so I'm, I'm thinking about opportunities to maybe take some pictures. So you, you become a little more in, in touch, I think, with nature, with our natural surroundings, time of year. And I, I think that's good. I, I, I think everybody could use a little more nature.